So, who is God? If someone is to ask you that question, how would you respond? We might get a lot of different responses. You know, some might, well, he's the big guy in the sky, right? He's the, the, main, he's the main dude. He, you might hear all kinds of different explanations of who God is. And uh, what's unique about that is the reason you get so many different explanations because all of us in some way have a different relationship with God. None of us are the same. None of us are unique. And I want to challenge you to start thinking right now about who is God and how do I relate to Him? How does He relate to me? On the screen you see a graphic there. It's on the front of your bulletin. You'll be seeing it a lot this year because the point of that graphic is this. It's what's the next level for you? We're going to be talking about next level this whole year because you see all of us are at some level of one or in our relationship with God, in our Christian walk. Whether you've been in a church 80 years or 50 years or 20 years or two days or this is your first day you've ever been in church, you have a level where you're in a relationship with God. And whatever that level might be, that means there's always room for growth. There's always how can I go to the next level? And one thing is I like about this graphic is you'll notice there are a couple of silhouettes there on there. One guy is going up the incline, and what's the other guy doing? He's helping him along. And that should be the picture of the church. When we're talking about growing with each other, we should be able to help others, and others help us. And we, we gather together, then we go up to the next level. Because I don't want us to think just, well, once you've arrived at that level, you've arrived. I want us to think of it more like this. And when I've gone to a point in my life and I've leveled out, then it's time for me to look at what's the next level. What is it that God is wanting me to do that maybe I've never done before? And I want us to be thinking about that this year. I want us, we're going we're gonna to do some things that give some very practical suggestions and ways for us to go to the next level. And because so many different people are on so many different levels... There's going to be several different things. One of the basic things we're going to challenge you to do this year, if you've never done this, have you ever been baptized into the Lord? Have you ever declared Him as Lord and Savior and said, this is what I want to do? The baptism in the Bible is one of those basic biblical teachings. There's a lot of different ideas on it, a lot of different things taught over the years in a lot of different ways. So in February, I'm going to have a class on Wednesday nights just about baptism. And there's some of you that were probably baptized as a baby, sprinkled as a, as a baby. But it's not something that you ever made a decision about. It's something that was done to you or for you. Well, I want to challenge you to, to explore the Scriptures and see what it says. It, it talks about us coming to the realization of who God is and responding to Him. And at the end of February, we're going to have a Sunday where we have a, a baptism Sunday where we're going to celebrate all of those that have decided, I'm going to take that step. Maybe that's your step. Maybe that's something you've thought about, you've heard about, but you've never done. Maybe this is the year for you to go to that next level in your walk with God. We're going to be challenging people to think about serving others, being involved in a service team. We have a lady in the church I baptized last summer, Lee Friend. And she's come and she's talked to me and says, you know, I really want to lead a group, a small group, but I want it to be a service group. And they're going to meet once a month with a purpose of not just gathering and studying and, and doing things together. They're going to go out and they're going to serve. They're going to do things in the community. They're going to do things to help within the congregation. It's going to take a lot of different people with a lot of different skills in there. And maybe you, that's something you've always thought sounded neat. You always thought, man, that person's a great person for doing that. Maybe that's your next level. Maybe that's your next step. Uh, we'll be having some science, more information on that coming. But we want to inform an impact team, a service team that is able to serve the community as well as those within the church. Maybe you've never been in a leadership position. Maybe you've never taught. Maybe you've never helped as a helper. Maybe you want to be a part of the youth program. Maybe you want to be a part of the music ministry, the multimedia. A lot of different things that are out there. This doesn't all just happen by itself. It takes people. And maybe you've thought, you know, I'd really kind of like to do that, but I've always been kind of scared. I'm not really sure what to do. I, you know, well, maybe this is your year. For you go to that next level, to go to that next step. Maybe it's, you just need a sense of belonging. 
You need to belong to a smaller group than what we gather here. We've had over 330 here through the doors, for including you, for worship this morning. Some of you will never see somebody that's in the first service. In fact, some of you that sit over here have never spoken to someone that sits over here, all right? That, that's just reality. And we're going to be challenging you to find a small group, to find a Bible school class. We've got two classes that meet at the 9.30 hour, which is ideal for those of you that come to this worship service. So you can come and attend a Bible school class and then come and be a part of worship. We have a class that meets at 11. We have some small group studies this week. We're starting a Tuesday morning ladies study at 9.30 and a men's study at 9.30. Be meeting in the fellowship center. The guys will be meeting over here. Maybe you need to be a part of a home group. We're going to start two home groups, two new home groups. We have a bulletin board out there that shows where all the ones that we have meet, what time, and who leads them. Maybe that's your next step. Maybe that's your next level. Whatever it might be, maybe it's getting into the Bible more. I I don't know. Whatever it might be, here's the challenge. Don't stay where you're at. Take the steps to go to the next level. So where do we start in that type of journey in our lives? Well, how about the very first verse of the Bible? In the beginning, God. And that's where we're going to start today. We're going to start out by thinking about God, who He is, and what He's done, and what He means to each one of us individually. Because if we skip past God, we've missed a major part of the deal, haven't we? It's not about what we can do, it's about who He is and how we relate to Him. So there's a bulletin insert there today, and it's a fill in the blank, and I'm going to put all those blanks for some of you who are nervous already, wanting to know if you've missed a blank. You haven't. We haven't got there yet, all right? And the uh, main, re- main reason I gave you because there's a lot of verses there. And I wanted you to have those verses. And what I'm sharing today came ab- about because I simply took the phrase, God is. And I wondered, what does the Bible say about God? What does the God- Bible say God is? So through the computer, the internet, you can uh, look things up. I looked up the phrase, God is, and looked at all the different verses, all the different places that phrase occurs. And it was quite an enlightening study. Now, I, I want to give you, every now and then I do that I, I, this year, I want to give you a next level challenge, all right? Now, we have a Bible reading program. It's in your bulletin. We're challenging you to read the first epistle of John this week, each day, Monday, chapter 1, Tuesday, chapter 2, on down the line. But I want to challenge you to the next level. I want you to, to go, there's a great website, It's called BibleGateway.com. Just those words, BibleGateway, no space, dot com. You put that in, and the first thing that pops up is a search um, uh, thing there. You can put in the phrase, God is. And instantly, all the phrases, all the verses where God is appears will be, you just scroll down. And I want you to read through those. I want you to categorize them. I want you to make some discoveries on your own. Go to the next level in finding out who he is. So what I'm going to share is just a simply sharing, scratching the surface of some of those things that I saw about God in his word. And the first, who is he? Who he is? Well, God is creator. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, that's a good place to start. And it goes contrary to what is taught in many schools today. It goes contrary for many people. Some would say, well, you know, it was all an accident. Some would say it all evolved. Some would say it just happened and we don't really know. It doesn't really matter. Well, I I don't know. I I think there's a design behind all this that we have. Now, I thought of this first service. I wish I would have thought of it last night. But I should have brought my box of Legos that I have at home, all right? Now you're wondering, why do you have Legos? Well, that's a whole other story. But anyway, and if I would have taken those Legos and I would have thrown them up in the air and they would have came down, what's the chances of it coming down and building the Disney castle right here on this table? There's no chance that that would happen. Because out of chaos comes more chaos. But when there's design, out of design comes order. And we live in a universe that has design, it has purpose, it has uh, an amazing thing. If you just look at the human body, it's an amazing, intricate 
design that God has put together. If you look at the design of a flower, it's amazing how all of that works together. It, see, I don't believe that zillions of years ago there were two cells that bumped into each other in primordial sludge and said, oh, I like you, I like you, well, let's hang out for a while. And then they bumped into two more and they said, hey, we get along pretty good, let's just keep collecting. And then, you know, the, we crawled out of that someday and here we are. I've heard someone say it takes more faith to believe in evolution than it does creation. Because there's a lot more gaps in there than... In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, I could go on, but if I preach that long on all the points, we're going to miss lunch today. So, uh, let's go on. Who He is? He is love. He is love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16 says, And so... We know and rely on the love of God has for us. God is love. God is love. You've heard that phrase. You've heard that over and over. One night this week, this is uh, one of the, the things that happens when you're a minister. I wake up in the middle of the night and that phrase, God is love, comes to my head because I start thinking over my sermon and things. And don't ask me why, it just happens, all right? And uh, it's like God kind of taps me on the shoulder. And what was interesting, I would never thought of that in this context. He said, God is love. And what does 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8 say? Well, it's the passage that describes love. And it hit me. Now, I have not taken any logic classes in high school or college. I'm sure I would flunk them if I did. But I know this much logic. If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. And I applied it to this verse in 1 John where it says God is love. And then 1 Corinthians 13 gives this definition of love. It says love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no records of wrong, love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth, it always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres, love never fails. So if A equals B and B equals C and God is love, and this is a description of love, I wonder what this would sound like if we inserted God in this passage. It'd sound like this. God is patient. God is kind. He does not envy. He does not boast. He is not proud. He is not rude. He's not self-seeking. He's not easily angered. He keeps no record of wrongs. God does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. He always hopes. He always protects. He always trusts. He always perseveres. God never fails. And I kind of like that. Because as I get to thinking about that, man, that is the, probably the best description of God that, uh, that I've heard. God is love. He's our creator. He also is light. 1 John 4, and that's one of the reasons I'm having you read 1 John this week, says this. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light and in him there is no darkness. Now, God is light, but to me the key word in that verse is darkness. Darkness. Because we all understand darkness. How many of you were scared of the dark when you were a kid? Anybody willing to? All right. How many of you still are scared of the dark? All right. Some of you still are. All right. I remember as a kid, we lived in this little house, and the furnace was kind of in the middle of the house. It was a little ranch, but I don't know why that's the way it was. But we used to sit in front of that furnace at night when it was cold, and when it's time to go to bed, we'd uh, have to. And I, I guess I didn't know where the light switch was in the hallway. I don't know, but it seemed like it was always dark, and I'd get up and I'd run through that hallway and jump in bed before the boogeyman would get me, all right? You know, it's just one of those kid things. You're... We understand darkness, and yet and we understand a lot more than just being afraid of the dark. We understand that darkness means pain and sorrow and loneliness and hurt and emptiness and evil and shame. And guilt. Darkness is a lot of things. 
Maybe you've said, man, I'm just in a dark spot right now in my life. You see, we understand darkness, and the great part about this verse, it says God is light. And in Him, there is no darkness at all. So if you're in a dark spot in your life, the best way to get rid of darkness is what? To find the light. To let God's light dispel the darkness. Light is much more powerful than darkness. And the closer you get to God, the more darkness is going to disappear. God's our creator. God is love. God is light. God's faithful. How important is faithfulness? In a relationship. How important was faithfulness when you were dating that special someone when you first started out? If you're dating someone, then you find out they're dating three other people at the same time. My guess is that didn't work out. How important is faithfulness in marriage? How important is faithfulness in good friendships? Faithfulness is everything, isn't it? If you don't have faithfulness, then it's going to be tough to have a good relationship. Deuteronomy 7 verse 9 says this about God. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God keeping His covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love Him and keep His commands. These words were said to the children of Israel after they'd gone through the Red Sea. They're standing there on the edge of the wilderness and God, in the book of Deuteronomy, is giving Moses all these instructions. And He makes that wonderful promise, God is God. Why would that need to be said? Because they'd come out of a culture and a nation where there was all kinds of gods. And God says, no, I am God and I am faithful. And He's going to keep His covenant. Is it just for the people in the desert that heard that? Did you catch it? Keeping His covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love Him. And keep his commands. That's good news because that kind of includes you and me. He has continues to be faithful just as he did when he said those words. Faithfulness is key to any relationship. God is faithful to us, and it will be key to you taking hold of that and understanding it as you build your relationship with him. God is merciful and forgiving. Daniel 9, 9 says this, The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving. Then catch this last phrase. This is the key. Even though we have rebelled against Him. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever rebelled against God or done something that you knew you were supposed to do? Yeah, you have, in case you're struggling with the answer there. (laughs) Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's as part of being human. But the great news is, the Lord our God is merciful, merciful and forgiving, even though we what? We have rebelled against Him. Where would we be without a merciful and forgiving God? We'd be in a mess. You've heard the phrase, you'd be up the creek without a paddle. Well, I'll say you'd be up a creek without a paddle and someone just punched a hole in the bottom of the canoe. That's where we'd be. Boy, I'm thankful that God is a merciful and forgiving God because I've needed His mercy and I've needed His forgiveness. And He promises it. So, who He is is very important. Who He is to me 
is very important. I want you to personalize it. Now, I'm not saying it's all about you, because really it's not. It's all about Him. But if you fail to have a connection with Him on a personal level, then you've fallen short on understanding what God wants of us. So we... Yeah, it's valid to ask, who is he to me? What, what does he mean to me in my life? Well, he's our refuge. Psalm 46.1 says this, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. He's our refuge and our strength. Have you ever needed to find refuge for something? How many of you were here during Irma last year, last September? Anybody stay here? Okay, how many of you spent that Storm out on your lanai. <laughs> we sought refuge. You sought shelter because there was danger. It was last summer. Judy and I we were out on the boat out in the sterile bay and we were fishing there in this little cove and up against the mangroves and we weren't watching the sky or anything. And, and uh, I felt the, the, the wind shift and the temperature dropped. And I thought, that's not good, all right? So we pull up anchor and we take out and we go around. And sure enough, down in the south was a dark sky. And it didn't take long. All of a sudden, there was this wall of water coming right at us. Shh. I hit full throttle. We're up in the north end. We're heading towards the bridge that goes across Carlos Pass, that goes over into Fort Myers Beach. Why were we doing that? Because I wanted to get to shelter before that wall of water hit us. And we almost made it. (laughs) It could have been worse, but uh, we got there and rode out most of that storm under the shelter of the bridge. You ever needed shelter in your life? You ever seen that wall of water bearing down on you? And you wonder, what am I going to do? God is our refuge and our strength and ever present. That's key. That means He's here. And ever present help in trouble. He's also my help, He's my rock. Psalm 18, verse 2 says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. It makes a difference where you seek shelter. It makes a difference where you seek refuge. It says He's a fortress. I like that imagery. We all have a picture of a fortress in our mind from pictures, or maybe you've visited. Any of you visited the fortress up at St. Augustine here in Florida? It, it's a, a neat fort. If you haven't been up there, you need to go up. We went one time, and I can't remember if I took a tour or I was just reading the stuff that's there. But what's interesting about that fort is when they built it, they were concerned about the material they built it with. Because they were used to building a fort in uh, France and Europe and Spain, all those places. They'd use big blocks of granite or big blocks of limestone that were almost guaranteed to repel any type of attack they would get. But they could be broken up eventually if enough cannonballs hit against it. Well, all they could find up there in that area was this um, stone that was basically compressed shells. So they mined that, they dug it up, and that whole fortress is made of this, and there's a name for it, I can't remember what the name of these blocks of these uh, compressed shell blocks. And they built that fort, this kind of unique design and star-shaped type of thing with points on it, and they weren't sure how it was going to do against cannonball attacks. Well, they finally... uh, It got tested. They got attacked, I believe, from the French. And much to their relief, what they found was those cannonballs, instead of coming and hitting on those walls and cracking them and bouncing off, they would come and they'd hit on those walls and they'd just stick like going into Play-Doh. Because that stone would compress and absorb all the shock and just catch the cannonballs. And that's the only... There's only two fortresses in America still standing, I think, and that is one of them, made out of a material they weren't sure was going to last. Where do you seek refuge? What kind of things do you seek refuge in? 
Can you trust in it? Psalm 18.2 says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. He is my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Turn to Him. That's who He needs to be to you. A fortress. A stronghold. And God is my help. Psalm 54, 4 says this, Surely God is my help. The Lord is the one and only who sustains me. Psalm 73, 26 says, My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Why do we shy away so many times from asking for help? You ever notice that? Someone asks you, you're, something's going on, hey, can I help you? No, I got this, I'm fine. Well, can I just help? No, 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 I'll, I'll be okay. I don't know if it's pride, I don't know if what it is, but you know, I'm the same way, you know. I was in the hospital, someone called, said, hey, can I, what can I do for you? I said, oh, I'm, I'm fine, I, I, there's nothing. Can I mow your grass? No, that's all right. What does God say? He, he says, look, God is my help. The Lord is the one who sustains me. That's who he needs to be to us. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't be afraid to turn to God and say, God, I, I messed this up big time. I need you here. Or Lord, I don't know how I'm going to deal with this issue that's come up in my life. Or Lord, I don't know what I'm going to do when this happens. Or whatever it might be. Remember Psalm 54.4, Surely God is my help, and the Lord is the one who sustains me. God is my salvation. Pop quiz time. How many little old ladies do you have to help across the street to earn your way into heaven? <laughs> thousand? Five thousand? Ten thousand? A million? Guess what? It doesn't matter. Because if you help a million little old ladies across the street, that's still not going to get your ticket punched to heaven. Now, it's a good thing. If you've been helping little old ladies across the street, keep that up, alright? It's not a bad thing. That's not what I'm saying. But the whole thing is, Paul says in Ephesians, it's by grace you are saved, lest any man should boast. Isaiah 12, 2 says, Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. He is the one that saves you. Get this. You cannot do it yourself. No matter how much you try. It's His grace and forgiveness. He is our rock. He is our salvation. That's who He is. One final thought. What does God do? Does He do anything? Uh, there again, I think it's important for us to see. And One of the things I like says, he fights for me. You ever had anybody stand up for you? Maybe out in the playground, your kid, somebody stood up for you, stepped in there for you. Deuteronomy 20 verse 4 says this, For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies and to give you victory. Here again, this is a promise to Moses as he's gathered with the children of Israel and they are, they, they are looking at a future that is totally uncertain. They don't have a clue what it's going to involve. They just crossed the Red Sea. They're heading out into the wilderness and they know there's armies out there. In fact, this is set up in verse 1 when it says, when you go to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and an army greater than yours, do not be afraid of them because the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt will be with you. And there is for, for the Lord your God. He's the one that goes with you. He's the one that will fight against your enemies. And He is the one who will give you victory. I just like the verse. God, you know, if I can't stand up and fight for myself, God's going to be there for me. He's going to fight. He's going to be there. 
He fights for us. He loves us. I like Deuteronomy chapter 20. I'm sorry, uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 33. And it says this. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? Wow. What a powerful, powerful verse. He fights for us. He'll be there with us and for us. And he gives us an opportunity for eternal life. So there you go. There's God in 20 minutes or less. Everything you needed to know, right? Nah. (laughs) Just scratch the surface. The very beginning of what he is. Who he is. And what he should mean to you. But if you haven't gotten anything else this whole time together today, get this. Because it's a good beginning point and ending point. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Let's pray.